if you're working in Abacus, one of the problems that students always struggle with is to how to plot the stress and strain plot from their simulation. And this is because there is really no button within Abacus that you can press and this stress and strain plot will be automatically generated for you. So this is why I'm making this video to quickly show you how to generate stress and strain plot from a simulation. And I'm going to do this using three approaches. The first approach is what I call a localized stress and strain plot. Second approach is a volume average stress and strain plot. And then the third approach is what I describe as an experimental equivalence approach. So let's sit back and relax as we get started with this modeling. Okay, so we're going to do this using a tensile specimen. So our tensile specimen would look like this. I've already designed this and basically it's got the left end which is where it is script and the other end where it is displaced. So I've also put in the material properties. So I want modeling with a polypropylene with and elastic properties and this and then um, hardening plasticity now we created a section for this a homogeneous solid section for that and then a loading step so there is my loading step that i'm using a static general loading step the only thing I, I wanted to note here is that in terms of the incrementation i've moved away from an automatic to a fixed implementation with a really tiny increment of 0 0.01 the idea is that i want to have as much data in my plot of course i haven't requested for any history i put in this first instance and then the left end is fixed with encastre so it's securely fixed and then on the right side i'm displacing it as normal so this is kind of what we're having here and then i've created the model i've submitted the model so now the first method i want to use to look into this is what i've called this localized stress and strain approach this is the contour plot that we generate from this simulation. So what we want to do with this is we can probe local points in this model to see what we can get. So this is the first approach that we want to use. And it's very simple. What we need to do is we go here and instead we're just going to extract the history output. And within this history output, we look for the setting point that we want to pick. So the first one we're going to pick here. So let's say just let's look at the gauge section alone. Now, what are the variables that we want to look at? So we're looking at a variable, you know, with a position in the in an integration point. So that means I'm looking for the strain in the one one direction. One one direction being the direction that we are displacing this model in. Okay, and then the stress also in that one one direction as well. So basically, those are the two variables that we're looking for: the stress and the strain in the one one direction. And now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to save that data okay so if we go back here you can see that the data is saved so i'm going to probably rename it i could say so let's just call it local s e11 and then this other one is local s11 let's attach g to distinguish it from another point so this is in the gauge section g being the gauge section of the material okay and then the final thing we can do quickly to do that is to operate on this data and in operating on this data, we look for the combine option and then the combine option E11 and S11 and we can plot the expression. So instantly we get our stress strain data from the simulation. So this is clearly for what's happening in the gauge section. So I can then, okay, rename that and call it, okay, this is my local S11 versus E11 in the gauge section. But what if we are trying to look at some other points in the model, let's say the shoulder. Would our stress strain be the same in the shoulder? Or maybe you have a variation of stress in that gauge section. So let's say there's a hole here and you want to also prove another point. So let's quickly do that. So again, we'll track the history, the field output. Okay. But this time around, we are picking an element in the shoulder. So let's just pick one element in that shoulder. Okay. And click done. So that means it's selected. We're also tracking the same variables of E11 and s11 okay and then we'll plot that okay so we'll see we've got that data okay different set of data so what i'm going to do with this data is i'm going to save it so this is the first one so i'm going to rename it i call it local s e11 shoulder sh for shoulder and then this other one i'm going to call it so local s11 shoulder Okay, so we've got that data and then we could do what we did before to operate on that data, use the combine option and say, okay, what I'm looking for here is E11 versus S11 in the shoulder. And then you plot that expression. So it gives you this data. So we can then go ahead and rename this and call it, okay, local S11 versus E11 in the shoulder. 
so we've got that data so these are kind of the key information so we can easily delete the other data points and just remove them from the model okay so these are the two so what what happens if we plot them together so if we add to plot so you could see instantly what's happening here so the red line is the shoulder data and the kind of bluish line is the gauge section data so this is a problem with doing a localized analysis because it really depends on where you're picking the model so you have to be intelligent in how you select where you probe in that model i wouldn't recommend this first approach because it has this tendency of giving different stressing data based on where you're lo locally assessing in the model and so in this case you can see that the shoulder is not experiencing as much deformation as we we'll expect compared to all the other points in the model okay so when you put the the contour plot with the graphical plot for these two cases this is sort of what you see so essentially the gauge section is deforming as expected showing the whole profile and then the shoulder is not deforming as much as would expect and so this is the, the challenge like i said of trying to do a local investigation associated with this so what we're going to do is to look at the next method if this is the kind of content that you like please do subscribe to this channel if you have not already done so so that when content like this are made you'll be the first to see it i also would encourage you to share like and leave me a comment in the comment section of this video of maybe ideas or videos you would like me to make or anything related to the video that interests you so for this next method it's going to be the volume average approach and this will be kind of the better approach to use rather than a, a localized approach because with volume averaging you're kind of averaging the behavior of the system across a region so the key thing here is to work with a region so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to say okay i'm going to copy that model so instead of localized i'm going to call him volume averaged over a region something like that and then with the volume average of our region so clearly one thing we need to do with this is that we need to identify a region where we want to investigate this behavior and i'm going to probably investigate it in the gauge section the true gauge section of this material so what we are going to do here so if we click on this which is partition the cell so i'll select the cell i want to partition and there's a previous mesh so i'm going to use not the node on the edge so let me just click on that edge and click at this point so that creates a partition and then I'll select the same thing again, normal to edge, select that edge, click this point. So now we have a clear region, which is our volume average region. So what I'm going to create is a set. So I'm going to call this my gauge section. So, and that will be only that region. So that's the region we're going to volume average and get the behavior of the system in that region. Okay. And the next thing we need to do with that is to create a history output because we need to track what is happening. So I'm going to call it my gauge section history output. Okay. And the thing that we are going to track is just that gauge section and it's S11 and E11. So that means the stress in the 11 one one direction and the strain in the 11 one one direction is what we're going to track. Okay. So the because we have made this partition, we need to mesh. So I'll just select okay so the machine we're working with is three global global size of three and everything we've selected okay clearly we are using hexahedral using sweep media and axis and then we could yeah so that's that's sort of the kind of simulation result that we want to get and then we can then go ahead and submit their job Okay, so this is the result you generate by the second approach where you're working with the volume average. So it's exactly the same kind of simulation as we got before, but now we have some interesting data to work with. So if we go to the create XY data, so we're, we've already asked for a certain history output that we're going to volume average. Then when you open this up, it will now introduce you to a set of data that we want. So this is the first set. So these are the E11 data. So I'm going to press down shift, select that first and then just drag all the way until you get to the point which is the end where E11 appear. So just around here, this is the end of E11. So we're going to save us and we're going to average that set of E11. So what we're trying to do here is that we're averaging the behavior of the strain in the gauge section. And I'm going to call it my volume average E11 in the gauge section as well. So I'm going to untick applied linked plot because there are other viewports so i'm going to untick that and ask it to plot just the data so when we click on that then it will evaluate and plot this data for us so we'll do the same for that so i'll press down this go all the way to the end press down shift 
and then select that means here i'm only focusing on the s11 data so we'll save this as again an average so this will be volume average of s11 data in the gauge section on tick they apply to linkedin data and apply that click ok so what this will do now is it will again generate a data for us so which are these two data so we'll now operate on that generator as stress strain data so by operating on this data so using the combined option so e11 versus s11 for the volume average case and then you plot that expression okay so we've got an interesting data here so i'm going to just save this so if we then rename it so this will be Vo volume average s11 versus e11 gauge section okay so again we've got that so i can just delete this because we needed that just to generate our plot so we've got our plot so that's method two so now let's move on to method three so with method three this is what i call the experimental equivalence approach and the principle here is that we're trying to create a model where you're kind of replicating exactly what you do in an experiment in terms of generating a false displacement profile and based on that false displacement profile you now find out your stress and strain data from that so if i now click copy i'm going to call this experimental equivalence so what we need to do with this if we open again back to the specimen so what we really need to do with this is that we need to extract the force and the specimen profile in that region what we need to do first is to introduce a point in that region so if i go to the assembly module so while i'm in the assembly module i want to introduce a central point where i'm going to put in so if we click on that so we'll select that region so i'll just click there and there so i've got a central point that i want to use for my reference point so we we'll now call that reference point so where would that reference point be there so that's the point that we're going to use and then within the assembly module we'll now create a set for that so this will be a ref point set and then we'll select that and that's done so we've got a set that we're going to use to apply our loading right on that point so the other thing that we then need to do while we're there is to create a history output so we go back to our history output so i'm going to rename the one we had previously which was the gauge section so this will now be a reference point history output okay and instead of tracking the history output that we wanted before of e11 e22 so again i'll switch that to a reference point set instead of e11 e22 now we're going for the reaction force in the one direction displacement in the one direction exactly what you will do in an experiment okay and then we'll click that so we've got that reference point we're tracking now the other thing is that we need to link the behavior the loading on the system to that reference point so i'm using a con constraint equation so this will be a constraint equation so using the kinematic equation approach so with one so the set name that we're going to link it to will be the right grip that we are loading degree of freedom one degree of freedom one and link it to that reference point set and this will be minus one so what this basically means that we are linking whatever is happening to the reference point to this space. So if we're applying a displacement to that reference point, it will be translated to that right brick. But what we are doing here will allow you to extract the reaction force and the displacement of that reference point. And this is why we're doing it this way. Now, the left end will still be fixed as before, but your displacement grid will be different. Now, we want this displacement to be on that reference point set. Okay? So now I click OK. So you can see what's happening here is that we're applying our displacement to that reference point, and then it will be translated to what's happening on that point, and then the behavior of the system will be as, as expected. And then we'll just go ahead and then submit the job to run. Okay, so the third case has been completed, and we get exactly the same kind of behavior as we had before, even though it was loaded slightly differently. So what we then need to do next is to extract the stress strain data. So we'll now go first. Again, we are working with the history output, and our history output will be based on those displacement data that we we imputed. So the reaction force and the displacement data. So those are the two things that we want. So we're going to save that just as it is so what you will notice here is that that the plot and so i've just renamed that so this would be experimental equivalence so let's call it equivalence of rf1 and the other one will be the same thing experimental equivalence of r of u1 
okay so we've got that exactly the way they are so we can again plot them so operate on this data go ahead and say okay i'm going to combine that data then displacement one again reaction force and then you plot the expression so this will be the first displacement data exactly as you will get in an experiment so i can go ahead and rename that and say okay this is experimental equivalence force um so rf1 versus e u1 data so exactly as you get it from an experiment there's no problem with that but clearly what we want here is the stress strain data okay in order for us to find out exactly what's happening in in terms of the stress strain data so let's go back to the part and get some values this is very interesting because what you're doing here is experimental so remember with experimental approach you're holding the back end here holding the front end here and this region in between is going to move there's a problem here because you've got the shoulder also moving and this other shoulder moving. Yes, they may not move as much as you get in that region, but they are also important in the behavior of the system. So what we can do is to find the length of the gauge section using this distant approach. So ultimately, our gauge section here will be 90 millimeter long or 90 units long. But unfortunately, that is too limited in terms of uh, the, we'll be missing out some information if we only use that. So what we want to do is to find what the original distance that is expanding. So this is traditionally what people do in experiment, but it, 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 it has its own problem. So what I will do here is I'll use this distance from that point to that point and then okay so that's a gauge section of 120 so we'll start with that yes there's a problem with that because you have the shoulder also contributing to the behavior of the system but we'll come back to that later on and then the other thing we need to do is to find what is the distance here to here so that is 30 and then the distance from here to there is 10 so this is 30 by 10 for the area and the gauge section in between that's the distance in between the loaded points would be 120 so we we'll use we'll bear that in mind so if we go back to our visualization module based on this third method okay so we'll now again operate on this data use the combine option now the first one would be the displacement so i'm going to divide by 120 okay comma and then the reaction force i'm going to divide that by 30 by 10 which are the two values required in this simulation and then you plot that expression okay and then we can save that data so if we save it so this will be the experimental equivalence s11 versus e11 okay so we're going to combine all the three graphs so starting first with the local value the shoulder value first so if we plot those two together Okay, so we already have that data showing us that, okay, this is the local value and this is the other value. Now, why not let's add the volume average value to it. So if we add this, okay, so the volume average data is exactly the same as the local gauge section data. There's no difference between the two, which we're not surprised about. We, this is what we would expect. However, when we add the third case, which is the equivalent, experimental equivalent, so if I add so there is a, a slight difference here between what's happening in the other ones and this other case. So initially, within the uh, linear elastic region, there's a little bit of difference between the experimental equivalence approach, way, which is extracted based on the gauge section and the others. And, and this is really due to the fact that you are having the, the effect of the shoulder coming into the simulation. The implication of this is that when you have an actual experimental data and you're trying to compare with your numerical data, be aware of the fact that the shoulder is contributing to the stress strain data and this is exactly what we are seeing here so when you are going to compare experimental data with a numerical data it makes sense to use this third approach because that mirrors your experiment compared to the other methods that typically are mentioned so if we combine everything together and then look at what's happening so clearly the sample is forming and then you're getting the behavior that will get but you know numerically which are the stress strain data as we said and there is a slight difference from what you get from the reaction force but essentially the behavior is consistent across board and that's those are the three ways that you can use in generating the stress strain data from an abacus simulation if this is the kind of video that you like please do subscribe to this channel so when content like this are made you'll be the first to see thank you and i'll see you in the next video bye bye